Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Jones. I have the pleasure of serving as the associate curator here at the National Civil Rights Museum, and it's an honor to have you all come out for our kickoff series for our 2023-2024 book and author series featuring Mrs. Lita McCullough Seletsky. Fifty-five years ago, on April 4th, 1968, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was struck by an assassin's bullet as he was standing outside of his room 306 on the second floor balcony here at the Lorraine Motel. In that infamous photograph taken almost immediately following the assassination, one man kneeled beside Dr. King, trying to stanch blood from his fatal head wound with a borrowed towel. The kneeling man was a member of the Invaders, a local group of activists that were influenced by the Black Panther Party for self-defense and participated in the Memphis sanitation workers strike in the spring of 1968. But he also had another identity, an undercover Memphis police officer reporting on the activities of the Invaders, which was thought to be possibly dangerous and potentially violent. That kneeling man is Lita, Mc Lita McCullough Seletsky's father, Morell McCullough. Mrs. McCullough Seletsky made the decision to find the truth of her father's connection to this unspeakable tragedy. But when that decision came risk, what would she uncover about her father who went on to become an agent of the CIA? And did she want to bear the weight of knowing? Mrs. Lita McCullough Seletsky is a National Endowment for the Arts 2022 Creative Writing Fellow whose work has been featured in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Oprah Magazine, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. A litigator turned essayist and memoirist, her essay, The Man in the Picture, published in O, the Oprah Magazine, was selected as the notable essay in Best American Essays in the year 2019. An alumnus of Northwestern University and the George Washington University Law School, she is the author of the book that we are all here today, The Kneeling Man. Join me in welcoming Mrs. Lita McCullough Seleski. Thank you so much, Ryan, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you to you all uh, for being here and joining us this evening. I am beyond honored to be here. It's very moving and it's good to be home. I'm gonna read a brief selection from uh, my book, The Kneeling Man. And this is going to be uh, from the beginning of the book, from chapter one, um, right at the beginning of that chapter. And that chapter is called Explosion. On Thursday, April 4th, 1968, just before six in the evening, five people stepped into the parking lot of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis and beheld a spectacle. No more than 10 yards away, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was leaning on the teal railing of the motel's second floor balcony, talking to a small crowd below. He and the crowd were laughing, their words just beyond hearing range as the last rays of sunlight glinted off the motel's rectangular picture windows. The group of five had been split between two cars, a cobalt blue Volkswagen Fastback and a white Pontiac Tempest, having just come from Claiborne Temple, where they were helping with grassroots efforts to support the city's striking sanitation workers. Their work wove an easy kinship between them, though one, the Volkswagen's driver, seemed a little quieter than the rest when conversation got going. They knew him as Morell, the 23-year-old minister of transportation for a black militant group called the Invaders. Others called him Mac. Just before noon that day, Mac had encountered three of them deep in conversation at the church. Hey, let's see if Morell will take us, said Clara, a brown-skinned student activist in bobby socks, as she gestured toward him. Standing beside her was Mary, another student activist, also in bobby socks. Take you where, he asked. 
Shopping for four button overalls, baby Jesus said. I need them for the march. Baby Jesus was what they called James Orange, aide to King and project coordinator for his Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. The nickname was ironic, given the man's six foot three, 300 pound frame. He towered over Mac, himself not a small man at a muscular six feet tall, plus a two inch afro. But baby Jesus's long goatee sprouted from a cherubic ebony face with gentle eyes framed by horn rimmed glasses. He'd been in town all week with colleagues from the SCLC planning for King's next big march for the sanitation workers. Mac nodded. Four button overalls were part of that peasant farmer vibe, the dury gur look for a poor people's demonstration. Clara had a car and could have taken baby Jesus shopping herself, but why not let the invader's transportation minister do the driving? They piled into Mac's car, first shopping at the shops along Main Street. Finding nothing, they checked the venerable old goldsmith's department store downtown, which carried a variety of menswear but not the overalls. Someone recommended checking the new Sears out east on Poplar Avenue. No luck. The pattern repeated itself all over town as they combed store after store without success. Finally, they returned to Claiborne Temple, where they ran into the fiery and slightly built James Bevel, who managed the SCLC's direct action and nonviolent education programs. By now, it was getting close to dinner time. Baby Jesus invited the college students to share a meal at the Lorraine, the SCLC's base of operations in Memphis. Bevel was planning to head there too, and it made sense for Mac to come along. The SCLC had rented the invaders a couple of rooms while the two groups were in talks about the role the invaders might play in the upcoming march. The five of them decided to carpool over with Mac driving baby Jesus and Bevel while Clara drove Mary. Dressed in jeans and a lightweight pullover jacket, Mac walked toward Clara's car, parked behind his. He recognized a few people in the crowd near King's balcony, members of a gospel group called the Operation Breadbasket Band. Orange and Bevel walked in their direction. Mac exchanged a few words with Clara and Mary. Just then, a thunderous boom echoed through the air. Mac looked up and saw King fall backward to the balcony floor. Dr. King has been shot, screamed someone in the crowd. Mac looked out in the direction opposite where King had been standing, toward a couple of ramshackle buildings across Mulberry Street. He saw no one, either in the buildings or on the ground. His eyes swept the parking lot, the street, the sidewalks. No one running, no one with a gun. Then he spotted a cluster of movement across Mulberry Street. People were running out of the rear door of the fire station just opposite the motel. He looked at the balcony again. One of King's aides, Reverend Jesse Jackson, peered out from behind an adjacent window toward King's fallen body. The next thing Mac knew, his legs were carrying him toward King, sprinting up an external staircase and onto the second floor balcony. Had he stopped to consider a course of action and the possible consequences, he probably would have melted into the crowd. But something automatic propelled him. As he reached the balcony, it occurred to him that the shooter might not be finished. He dropped to a crawl and made his way to King, grabbing a white towel from a cleaning cart along the way. Mac's eyes locked on the gaping hole in the right side of King's head and neck. The wound began around his cheek cheekbone, traveling down under his Adam's apple. It looked strange, the way the flesh erupted outward, torn back. Droplets of blood speckled the front of King's shirt from the collar to the middle of his torso. Mac's mind searched for methods to stop the bleeding. There were only two, 
a tourniquet, which obviously wouldn't work here, and pressure. He pressed the towel into the wound. Who did this? He wondered. Where did the shot come from? Thank you. You know, Lita, just sitting here listening to you read that, I don't know that I've heard a more intimate yet descriptive narration of those final 10 moments of Dr. King's life. Um, and for those that are out there here and abroad, the book reads like that for the entire book. So if you have not purchased the book, please purchase this book. This is an incredible, intimate memoir of a story uh, that has plagued American history in the past 55 years. And so you and I will have a conversation and, and we'll talk about the origins of this book, the, some of the obstacles you've had to overcome and, and, and seeing how it's uh, looked today. But one thing I wanna do before we do that is, you got to tour the museum this afternoon and we all have seen that photograph taken by Joseph Lau, this, this journalist who was here to do a report on Dr. King. And, and we see the pointing in the buildings and the areas di directly across Mulberry Street. You got the opportunity to stand in that same space that your father instinctively ran to today. What was that like? I struggle to find the words to describe what that was like. The energy in that space, what happened there, it still reverberates today. And, um, you know, I mean, it's one thing to do research and, you know, read about an event, you know, and even look at photographs and, and talk to people who were there, but to physically be there is something else altogether. And, you know, it's, the pain is very fresh still, but at the same time, I have a deep sense that it is not in vain, that although this is a place of tragedy, it's also a place for hope, the rebirth of a hope that was being launched here. And so, um, yeah, it's very emotional and uh, something that I will always cherish, you know, the, the chance to actually be in that space. Thank you. So let's talk about the beginning of the book, the origins of this book. Uh, just where did this journey begin? When, how old were you? When did you find out that your father was Morel McCullough, the man in this photograph that the rest of the world perceives as of what took place here at the Lorraine Motel. Yes, so this journey began probably when I was about three or four years old, and I'm not even kidding. I mean, it would have begun when um, I was a small child and my mother showed my uh, younger brother Micah and me this photograph that, you know, I mean, this is a photograph that is inescapable if you not only if you're in Memphis but if you know you are engaging with any story that has to do with um, the 20th century that has to do with civil rights that has to do with American history or even world you know freedom movements movements for liberation and um, so this photo was around it was probably in the newspaper somewhere but she showed this to us and told us um, you know, explained that this was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and that the man uh, kneeling beside Dr. King was our father, and that he was a police officer. And just from, you know, what she said, of course, taking in the photo and, you know, what you can see clearly this moment of um, great tragedy um, and, and the the, the drama of the pointing. It's just a photo that when you see it, it's telegraphing to you a, a moment of great import. Um, I knew that this was something important in the way that my mom was talking about it. And she, but she, at the same time, she was, I felt like she was telegraphing that 
you know, what I'm telling you right now is pretty much the extent of the discussion that we're going to ever have about it. And, you know, I picked up on that. Of course, there were a lot of other reasons, you know, things bound up, you know, with, with that. You know, my parents had recently split, and it was not a, um, you know, a, a happy parting. You know, it was pretty um, acrimonious. And so I feel like my feelings about my parents' divorce kind of became entangled and bound up with my feelings about the photograph. But um, I would say if there were, if I could pinpoint a moment where this journey to the book began, it would have begun in that moment and then going through childhood, knowing that that was my father, um, knowing he was a police officer, but knowing nothing else about it until I happened to, as a teenager in high school, happen upon a, um, an article in the Memphis Commercial Appeal newspaper, because I would come home and like page through the newspaper, that was just the kind of kid I was, and you know, reading through, and I found an article talking about the assassination and kind of the circumstances around it, and um, this article mentioned that my father, you know, there's his name, he was an undercover officer. He wasn't just like, you know, a police officer responding to this uh, shooting, he was undercover. The other people on this balcony did not know he was a police officer and that he, in fact, had infiltrated a black activist group in Memphis called the Invaders. I'd never heard of the Invaders, but I was, by this time, pretty socially conscious, and I had read about the Black Panthers. So to my mind, you know, taking what I had read in the article and kind of putting that together with what I knew about, um, you know, black liberation movements, I likened the invaders to the Panthers, um, who, whom I really admired. And so I was devastated by that. I couldn't understand it. I could not understand how a black person could infiltrate a group of people who, you know, were presumably fighting for black people's rights, black people's, you know, freedom. How could, how could a black person infiltrate this group and then report back to law enforcement? Um, and in processing all of this, I, you know, I feel that I just compartmentalized it. I just set it aside. I put it in this box that, you know, was sort of like, you know, much as my, you know, mother and my other relatives did not go there with regard to, you know, that photo and information about my dad, I kind of didn't go there either. I continued that silence. Um, and it was only many years later that I realized um, that's not a way to live. And especially once I had children, I felt that it was not fair to them to pass that down to them, that it was important for them to understand who their grandfather was and understand what our legacy is as a family. And so that is when um, I decided that I needed to, not only did I need to know the story and I needed, I, I needed to document the story. And by the way, it's bigger than us. It's, you know, it's, it's American history um, and it's world history. Um, and so uh, that is, is how this book uh, came into being. And so here you are, you, you, you find that your father is not only in this historical photograph, but then he has this other lifestyle. And your father, in pertaining to the assassination, what's, he was very recluse to it. It, it was rare that... There were no interviews. It, he was this shadowy figure in this story. We see the Jesse Jacksons, the Andrew Youngs, the Ralph Abernathy's, but who's this man closest to Dr. King? And so when you decided to approach your dad about this new revelation, talk a little bit about how, what, were, what, what were you thinking, how you would approach him? Was he very forthcoming about it? And, just kind of the journeys, and when he did do it, what were the reflections of some of his upbringing in his past? Yes, um, so once I made up my mind that I had to get the story, I mean, just to set the scene, so at this point, I'm in my 30s, I am, um, I'd grown up in Memphis, left, went off to college, went off to law school, you know, got married, was living in Houston, Texas, and I was practicing law. So, you know, I was a litigator. I had actually, you know, I was in the courtroom. And so I, I think that I really kind of took a litigation approach to it. 
Um, and so I thought, uh, I'm going to get this story. It might not be pretty. It might not be graceful, but I'm just going to ask him, how else can I do this? You know, there's no real way to ease into it. Um, so I just thought I will call him and um, I'm just going to put the question to him. And it was super awkward. You know, I called him up and I mean, normally we would we would talk on occasion, but we weren't that close because how can you be that close with someone where you've been dancing around this enormous silence for so long, something that is so um, kind of uh, central to their experience, uh, you know, their, their life. So I was just like, you know, I started off like our normal conversation, you know, hey, dad, how you doing? Oh, yeah, we're doing fine. Yeah, the wet is hot. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then uh, so... You know, I was just thinking, we never talked about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. <laughs> and I mean, it, it, then it's just like silent, you know. And so then I say, you know, I, I just would like to know what happened. And, um, you know, also, I don't, I don't know a lot about your life. We, you know, we've never talked about your childhood. I don't know anything about your upbringing. So, um, yeah, I would like to know. So then a couple of awkward moments, you know, pass. And then my dad, I mean, I feel like he laughed a little bit, kind of under his breath, like, hmm, yeah, here we go. Like, <laughs> finally, she asks. And so he said, um, you know, that's, that's a lot. Like, that's a big question. So why don't we do this? I will prepare some notes for you. And you can read those. And then we will kind of take it from there. And so shortly after that, I get this email um, with an attachment and, you know, Word, you know, it's a Word document. As I recall, courier font, you know, I opened this document and it's 17 pages of notes. Um, and so this is, this is what I asked for. It was kind of intimidating to get it, you know, even though I had asked for this, it's sort of like, okay, well, now I actually have to read this and process it. So I start out, you know, reading it, and actually he had at the beginning this big preamble, um, and it said something to the effect that, you know, um, I will not, you know, even though I, I will tell you about my life, something like that, but I will not disclose any secrets or classified information. I mean, it was kind of like, like government boilerplate type of language. And I just thought, uh-oh, well, I mean, what's he about to say? Like, what, you know, what in the world? And so then I start reading. And it picks up, I mean, it starts like, you know, I was born, um, you know, 1944 in Tibbs, Mississippi. And he kind of describes it. And, you know, it's, it's um, part of it are almost, they're not bullets, but they're almost like bullet points, like thumbnail sketches. Um, he lists out his family members, you know, his mother, Lucille McCullough, his father, Walter McCullough, and, you know, the land that they lived on, and then all of his siblings. He was one of 12 children born to Lucille and Walter. And um, so then he, he walks through, you know, just like some little character descriptions, you know, his uh, mother, you know, she uh, was vain. She um, would primp herself in the potato field or whatever. And I was thinking, OK, well, that's where I get that from. But um, <laughs> and, you know, his father, his nickname, you know, it was Nap. And one of his eyes was crossed because he was hitting the eye with a rock. And so now he's filling out these personal details. These people are getting fleshed out, like they're coming to life. And I can feel the emotions rising up, like, okay, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, like I'm feeling, I'm having a hard time because I just know, you know, 1944, Tibbs, Mississippi, black people, um, this is, this is going to be bad, <laughs> you know, and I wasn't wrong. So I'm reading down, and then I get to page three, and he tells this story about when he was I want to say three years old or so. And he and his father, Walter, had been, you know, had been to the cotton gin. You know, they grew and picked cotton on this land um, that they rented. And uh, then they had stopped at a general store. And the store had a porch. And there were these white men who were on the porch. Um, and so he and his father go in the store. And I'm reading it like, oh, no, oh, no. Like, why is he telling me this? This is not going to be good. <laughs> and, you know, they go in. They get what they want. 
And then they come out of the store. And one of the white men walks up to Walter and my dad. And in his hand, he's got a black cherry soda. And he offers it to my dad. This is a soda that this man had been drinking out of. And my father, you know, young little Mac, is like, no, I don't want it. <laughs> and Walter becomes immediately, like, really upset and tense. And he says, take it, boy. Like that, like really mad. And Mac was so confused because he couldn't understand. All of his life he'd been told, do not drink behind people. You can't, you know, drink something behind somebody. So he couldn't understand why then was he having to take this? And why was his father so upset about it? And the line from the notes was something like, you know, I thought, why do I have to take this? And after reading that, like, that's when I lost it. I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, it was too much. I started bawling. Like, all this pent-up emotion, I mean, this is probably emotion that went back, like, years, you know, it wasn't just the notes, but... It was like a damn, just like burst. And so I closed that little word document and I was like, I'm just not ready for this. I will come back to this when I am ready. And that happened to be five years later, but that's, you know, that's a whole other story. But yes, um, so that was sort of getting the story. And so to answer your questions about, you know, was my father forthcoming? Yes, he was extremely forthcoming. And in many ways, he was more ready to tell the story than I was to hear it. And so picking up off of that, you know, it's 1967, your father has been in the service and he's, he's relocated to Memphis. And talk about this story of where does him becoming a Memphis police officer come into this story and how does that lead us to the time that he's associated with the invaders and Dr. King in Memphis? Yes, and this is quite a, you know, circuitous, like, winding story because my father never aspired to be a police officer. He never wanted to be in law enforcement. That was not a career that particularly appealed to him. The reason why he ended up applying to join the Memphis police force was because um, when he enlisted in the Army in 1964, and you know, took the exam that you take and was placed, he was placed by the army in the military police. So, you know, he does his, you know, eight weeks of training down in Georgia or whatever. He's a military policeman, he's an MP. And so he did that for three years. Um, and so when he came out of the army in 1967 with his GED, which he had to earn um, while in the service, which is, you know, there's a story behind that as well. Um, he was tricked into dropping out of high school, essentially. But when he came out of the Army, he had, uh, and then moved to Memphis, he had a GED, and then he had, like, one thing on his resume, and that was MP. And so he couldn't get a job, tried and tried, you know, walking the pavement day after day, and getting pretty down about it. And then finally his cousin, Eugene, who um, had positions of some responsibility at a couple of uh, workplaces. One of them was Memphis Ash and Door. The other one was a motorboat repair company. His cousin Eugene said, well, why don't you just come on over and work, with, work for me? Um, which, I mean, these were very low level jobs that paid you know, minimum wage, whatever that would have been at the time, like a dollar an hour or something. Um, but it gave him some purpose. And so you know, it was something to work for, gave him some pocket money. And so this is what my dad did in the months after uh, he was discharged. In February 1967, you know, it, it took him a while to get these jobs. And so these were his jobs. These were his career prospects in Memphis. And so he and Eugene would ride to work day after day. Um, they'd work. Um, yeah, they'd get up before the sun came up, go work their shift, a full shift at the um, Sash and Door Company, and then leave that and go work another full shift at the motorboat company, and then go home, <laughs> eat, go to bed, do it again. And so it just so happened that one day they were riding to work in the wee hours, the early morning hours, and um, an ad came on the radio. They were listening to talk radio, and a recruiting ad came on, and it was for the Memphis Police Department, saying, you know, we're recruiting, come on down to the headquarters, you know? And, um, I mean, my dad, I don't even think he was really paying much mind to it at all, but Eugene 
you know, like when he heard Memphis police recruiting, he thought, you know, or not thought, he said, hey, Mac, you know, uh, weren't you a police officer in the Army? You ought to go apply for this. You might be able to get this. And my dad was just completely incredulous. You know, he just thought, Memphis police, like, they're not going to hire me. Like, you know, it's, this is, no, they, do they even have any black officers? So, which, I mean, he wasn't that far off the mark because at the time, Memphis was about a third black or so, and the police force was about 5.5% black. So talk about some disparities there. But Eugene said, well, you don't know that. You don't know. Um, you ought to just go down there and try. And so my dad, you know, drops Eugene off at the uh, Sash and Door place and goes on down to headquarters. And he thinks, you know, he's, he's dressed to work in a warehouse. So he walks in and thinks he's just going to take this application home, fill it out, drop it off, get it done, get Eugene kind of like off his back, like make him happy. It doesn't turn out that way at all because, as it turns out, that day that they heard that ad was the last day to apply. He had to get his application in that day. And there were a lot of steps to it. I mean, he had to, he ended up having to run, like, he had to drive to Mississippi to get a letter and, you know, filling out, you know, getting your references together. And that very evening, then, he had to sit for the civil service exam. This was not something that he had bargained for. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he did all this and ended up getting hired. He made it. And so that's how he wound up being a police officer. Now, the second part of that question, how do you go from being a police officer to being an invader? Again, this is also another kind of winding and just really uncanny set of events that happened because coming out of the police academy in um, December 1967, December 6th, um, he was just a regular patrolman. He started off doing foot patrols at the Lamar Airway Shopping Center. And then he went from there to doing car patrols um, in Orange Mound, Castalia, and um, in Hollywood. And, you know, so he was just doing regular police officer stuff. His face and name uh, had been in the newspaper a couple times. Like, you know, he was wearing a uniform. And then, so this is taking him from December through January. And then what happens in February 1968 the historic sanitation strike, which was unprecedented in Memphis. You know, these sanitation workers, you know, black workers being disrespected, underpaid. You know, two of them um, had been killed. I mean, it just, you know, it, it just ignited something where these workers said, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And they went on strike. Law enforcement gets involved because there's a concern um, in the police department that there may be folks, strike, strike supporters, who might try to interfere with the collection of the trash um, and who might even try to hurt the, the scabs, you know, the, the folks who the city has hired to um, collect the garbage in the absence of the striking workers. So they've got, you know, these scabs driving the, the trucks and there are reports of, you know, gunshots being fired at the scabs and this and that. And so the police department ends up assigning the um, patrol officers to 12-hour shifts in addition to their normal shifts, escorting the trucks to make sure no one tries to interfere with the trucks or the scabs. My dad is one of these officers working this additional 12-hour shift. Then he goes from that to guarding uh, one of the landfills, you know, which, you know, I'm sure he was thinking coming out of the um, academy, you know, this was not something that he aspired to do, you know, to be standing in a hut at a landfill watching like nothing happen. I mean, by the way, my dad never saw any interference with the trucks. He never, you know, there was nothing. It was just dull. Um, but that's what he was doing until one day he gets a call at the landfill to come down to headquarters to talk to the assistant chief of police, um, assistant chief Lux at the time. He goes to uh, Lux's office where he is met by several members of the police department's intelligence bureau. And there are a couple of, there are a couple of black officers in there as well. And so my dad and another black officer um, are asked, Lux asks them, if they would, um, 
well, actually, let me step back for a second. He, you know, tells them that you know there are these um, uh, meetings that are happening, mass meetings at Claiborne Temple, and law enforcement, the intelligence bureau, is concerned about what is being discussed and planned in these mass meetings. Again, expressing this idea that somehow, you know, someone may be planning some kind of trouble or mayhem or, you know, upheaval, disorder. And so he asks my dad and this other black officer as being, you know, a couple of the few officers who could possibly blend in in such a meeting, if they would go down in plain clothes to uh, Claiborne Temple, simply just listen in and report back on what what they're planning, what are they doing, what are they talking about? And so my father, you know, he's 23 years old, he's this rookie, you know, he's gotten, you know, he's away from the landfill, <laughs> so he's like, sure. You know, he doesn't see anything wrong, you know, he's not thinking about the potential implications of this, nor is anyone really thinking about, like, the First Amendment, like, no, this is not the way they're thinking, they're just thinking of you know, heading off trouble. And so my dad does this. He goes down to Claiborne Temple, he and this other officer, in their plain clothes, they sit there, they listen in. And over time, this assignment evolved and, you know, kind of organically became, you know, hey, Mac, by the way, there's this group called the Invaders. And we understand that they're down there at the temple and they're trying to get involved in this strike. And, you know, we just don't, you know, we don't want a situation where they're trying to radicalize people and cause trouble. Um, and so can you see if you can befriend some of these guys and kind of get to know, you know, what they're planning to do? And so that is how my dad went from, you know, patrolman, normal officer, to um, befriending invaders, which turned into becoming an invader, which turned into becoming Minister of Transportation, which, you know, um, was covered a little bit in the excerpts that I read. So bringing us up to that point, Dr. King comes to Memphis on behalf of the sanitation workers. He returns after a march that breaks out on the week prior to his death. Uh, the media is is hounding Dr. King while he's preparing to go to Washington that summer for the Poor People's Campaign. And then, you know, April 4, 1968 takes place. And so we, we, when you find out around four or five years old and then you finally confront your dad about what you have been uncovering, with any political assassination, the thought of who did it is the first question, right? Um, and so with these lingering questions and the scenarios of whether James O. Ray, the alleged accused assassin of Dr. King, or whether Dr. King was a victim of a conspiracy, your dad has been tied to some of these lingering questions. Just a little bit. How did they make your dad feel? And how did they impact you during this time of when you're trying to collect all this information to write this book? Yeah, trying to get my dad to talk about how he felt <laughs> or feels. I mean, I think this is part of the reason why it took me like six and a half years <laughs> to even get the story because he, I think, you know, how I talked about compartmentalizing things, I believe that he also, likewise, so much more than I did, compartmentalized sort of how he felt about what he was doing um, versus the job. You know, he supported the civil rights movement. He was, you know, someone who um, admired Dr. King, you know, um, greatly, of course, um, but at the same time was doing this job, which he told himself, you know, if I'm just listening in and making sure that there's no mayhem afoot and I'm reporting back on the truth of that, I don't see anything wrong with that. So, yeah, his feelings, you know, it's, it, it's been really difficult um, to really uh, get him, I think, even to confront the feelings that he had and to admit that he has those feelings, um, which is really a valuable process. And so his feelings about the um, conspiracy theories that name him, I mean, he was pretty clear that he was very angry. He was really angry. Um, I mean, there was one uh, book in particular that angered him simply because it was stating things about him and his life and his identity that were just simply not factual. Um, but I also think that um, 
And this is not something that he would explicitly say. I mean, because part of my dad's personality, you know, he's kind of the strong, silent type a little bit when it comes to this kind of thing, you know, feelings. But he, um, I think he was deeply hurt. I think it was so painful to him. I can see him, you know, in this picture. It's, it's, um, it's really kind of tough to see. But he, that... You know, here is a man who was, you know, he happened to be there. And, you know, he, most of us, we don't have the instinct to rush into an active shooter situation. You know, most people are going to go away from where someone was shot. They're not going to go towards that situation. And how much more so if you actually are part of a very sensitive undercover operation, are you really going to want to, like, stand out and be in the limelight by running up a staircase and, you know... In, in this situation, but that's exactly who my dad is. He ran into that situation, you know, knowing that he had the training to deal with someone who had been wounded. And I mean, not only is it the Dr. King who's been shot, but this is a human being who was just shot. And my dad knows, you know, if somebody can stop the bleeding, that's going to help this man. So he ran up there to attempt first aid. And then to have that turned around on him and weaponized against him to say, oh, well, actually, you, you were complicit in this and you were involved in that. I think that that was deeply painful. Yeah. Just want to keep everyone, the, the photograph that we have is an outtake of the photograph that we're accustomed to seeing and you can see a young Mac McCullough consoling Mrs. Clara Jean Esther as well as one of her uh, schoolmates, Mrs. Mary Ellen Hunt. And again, you see some of those same familiar faces on the balcony. Um, but this is one of those photographs that rarely is seen. Let's make my last question, and then we're going to open up to our audience that are here as well as those that are watching and tuning in abroad. For those that are following us, please do purchase the, uh, the book. It's on sale here at the museum, civilrightsmuseum.org store. And the book is called, again, The Kneeling Man. Lita, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you're the first African-American male or female to fully author a book on the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. 55 years later. That, yes, please, please. And the climate that this society is recycling in into some of these old ways from the modern civil rights movement um, a, what does that mean to you? And then second, what do you want readers to take from this book? And what does your father think about the book? Yes, um, <laughs> I did not know that. I, and that is really, um, it's, it, it's an honor. Again, you know, I, um, I did find myself asking often as I was conducting research and, um, you know, just trying to find other books about this because, you know, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. If somebody has, you know, covered the field, I would like to know about it. And so I was wondering, like, where are the black authors? <laughs> you know, like, where, where are the books? I mean, with, uh, you know, this event and having happened in Memphis and having been so central to, you know, our struggle as black people for equality, I just wondered, like, where are the, where are the black um, subject matter experts? I know that they are there, you know, what's, and, and I think it speaks to um, just the systemic um, reasons why we, uh, you know, as black people, oftentimes our, our own voices are not heard and not championed and not platformed. Um, and that's something that's got to change. It's so difficult um, for black folks to actually tell our stories and be considered authorities on our own experiences. And so for me to be an author, uh, you know, of this book, I mean, that's authority, right? And so that, that means so much to me, and it's a responsibility that I take very seriously. Um, what does my dad think about the book? He is over the moon. He, he's very happy. He's very proud. And um, 
one of the last questions that I asked him when I interviewed him was, you know, we've been talking about this for a while, like from uh, late 2015 through, you know, early 2022, um, and, and we've answered, you know, you've a answered a lot of questions. Is there anything else, like wrapping up, like is there something else that you want people to know? What do you want, what else do you want readers to know? And by this time, I already had like a draft manuscript of the book that he had read, and he said, everything that I want readers to know is in that manuscript. And so to me, you know, at, at that point, I thought, no matter what happens out in the marketplace and the reviews, whatever, like to me, the book is a success. <laughs> So everyone, uh, you were given an index card when you came in. If uh, our education manager, Mrs. Dory Lerner, holding her hands up, she'll collect some of those and she, we'll try and get some of those questions asked. So here's a question from the audience here. The Memphis Police Department was majority white, as you stated. 5.5% was black, right? Do you believe that he had a choice to go undercover or not go? In your opinion, do you back people facing the same situation today or have things changed? That's a great question. And it's a difficult question because I think um, on one level, yes, he did have a choice. He could have said, no, I, you know, assistant, you know, Chief Lux, I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't do that. You know, he would have had personally the agency to say those words in that room. But the bigger picture is that he was so constrained by the circumstances in which he was working and living. You know, somebody recently said in um, an interview that I had um, on the radio, and I like the way that they put this. They said that they look at racism kind of like a chessboard. And so, you know, the role that you have in a racist society is kind of like the chess piece. It, it, it constrains the way you can move. You can only move in a certain way. So, you know, just like the, the queen can work, you know, move in all the directions. The bishop can move diagonally, you know. The pawn can move like one move forward or, you know. And so um, I think that, I think that's right. And so I think that my father, in the position that he was in, really could only move in certain ways. And so, yeah, I mean, had he said, no, I'm not going to do that, then, you know, I think it's pretty uh, clear that probably he would have been pushed out of the job that he had. I could definitely easily see a scenario because, you know, throughout the academy, it was always emphasized that you need to be somebody that the other officers feel like they can ride with. In other words, you have to have the trust and the confidence of your peers. And if you don't have that and you're not somebody that they can ride with, you're not going to last on that force. So um, he would have been looking at losing that job, not being somebody that they could ride with, not a trusted person, edged out, maybe back at Memphis Ash and Door for all we know, you know. And so I can see why, you know, he, um, yes, he had agency, but at the same time, his moves were very much circumscribed by um, the circumstances in which he was living and working. Another question from the audience. One of the reasons you chose to write this book was to preserve and protect the family legacy. You being a mom yourself, how do your children respond to the revelations in this book and their grandfather? Yes, um, I mean, this, this was a, a really important part of, of uh, writing the book is, I mean, because really one of the underlying questions I had, you know, beyond, you know, what happened at the Lorraine, which is of course hugely important, and you know these questions need to be answered. They're still unanswered questions, by the way. But you know, 
the other question that was so important and perhaps you know on a personal level really critical to me was who is my father who is this man and so um, I think in writing this book and learning about his story, his thinking, you know, the reasons behind the actions that he took and being able to pass that on to my kids instead of the silence and the unease and really the sense of dread around what might have been. Um, my kids are so proud. You know, and it's not only my kids, but the other, you know, the, the, the youngest generations of our family. I mean, my father right now is the patriarch of the family. Out of the 12 McCullough children, you know, from Tibbs, Mississippi, he's the last one living. Um, and so to be able to point to the story and read about his life and about his choices and how, you know, even working within these oppressive systems, he was able to um, resist in certain ways. I think it gives them a sense of pride and it shows them how, and I think this is important and something I want all readers to take away, you know, that whether you're within these oppressive systems or outside of them, there are ways to resist and, and, and it's important to, to see kind of what resistance might look like in the position that you're in, you know, on this chessboard. Um, but also to understand at the same time when you do resist, there is a price to be paid. We're gonna do one more question here, and these are these are compelling ones. Um, and one, I'll, I'll help you in answering. And that th those questions are: Was your father connected in any way with civil rights photographer and police officer Ernest Withers? And would you state that he's in the same category as an Ernest Withers or even um, William O'Neill, who was an informant against Fred Hampton and the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party? And then I'll, I'll ask the second part of that question after you answer this one. All right. Um, so um, was my father connected with Withers? No, they were not personally connected, though they certainly, certainly their paths did cross because Withers was everywhere. He was in every room. And of course, now we know much more to that story. Um, and I think it's interesting, and I mentioned it in the book, that my father told me, like, he, when he was around Withers, he definitely got this feeling like, there's something more going on here, you know, and it's sort of like, uh, there's a saying, you know, a fisherman recognizes a fisherman from afar, you know, they, my dad definitely picked up on something extra, um, there. And then, um, the second question was, would I, like, liken my dad to some of these other, um, just... Well, to some of the informants that we know about, or to Withers. And I would say, uh, to my mind, I think that there is a distinction between a commissioned officer who is embedded in an organization working undercover and someone who is a paid informant, who um, I think would have very different motivations um, for the work that they're doing, depending on the circumstances. And I think that when we're talking about these different cases, it's not so helpful to lump them together because I think that each story um, has its own context. And I think it's um, the responsible way to examine them is with specificity to those stories. Interesting. We had a question about uh, one of the photographs, and it, it appeared that it looked like Dr. King, and I'll, I'll pull it back up right here. This one right here. It looks like, why is no one attending to Dr. King? So in, at the scene right here, we see Shelby County Sheriff's Deputy Bill DeFore with Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, there's Jesse Jackson, and then of course there's another white man in between right below your father named James Leu, who's staying in room 309. Of course, there's Mac McCullough and Miss Esther and Miss Hunt. At this particular time, the ambulance has now turned in from Butler into Mulberry Street to be transported to St. Joseph's Hospital. A according to everyone, including your father, who saw this wound, Andrew Young, I think, has said it the best of any of Dr. King's aides, and it was as if he had died a beautiful death to the point where that he had this expression of peace, content, and more so relief in what took place. And so uh, 
photographs tell a many, many different stories, and they certainly did so with this. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight to the National Civil Rights Museum so that we were able and privileged enough to have Mrs. Lita McCullough Selecki uh, and continue to thank and, and support the National Civil Rights Museum. Uh, next in September on the 6th, we have the convening, the third part of our response to the senseless murder of Tyree Nichols and our annual fundraising event, the Freedom Awards of 2023 on Thursday, October the 19th. And in conclusion, we, the National Civil Rights Museum, are grateful for our generous supporters who make us our, inspirational, our inspirational book talks happen this evening. I challenge everyone here to help us continue a much more dynamic programming like tonight's event by making a gift or becoming a member of the museum today. Please visit us at civilrightsmuseum.org slash give. Or you can also scan our QR code that we will have available on the, on the screen. Thank you again. Mrs. McCullough Selecki will now begin our book and author signing. Thank you.